So it's scary out there. I'm not talking about the election. By the way, if I were talking about the election, what I would say is this too will pass. And if you've had kidney stones, you know how painful it may be. But what I meant by it's scary out there is customers are in charge. Customers know that they're in charge. From time to time, it's tempting to forget this. And that's a bad move. So, let me read you a little something from a company that got some bad advice from their lawyers. And this is how it played out on Yelp. I have changed the name of the company. It's a restaurant. Because honestly, I think they've um, suffered enough. But other than changing the name of the restaurant, all of this is verbatim from Yelp. All right, you ready? On March 3rd, I posted a restaurant review on this website. The website was Yelp. Seven days later, I was threatened with a lawsuit by an attorney representing Serenity Seafood Cafe for two unverified statements that I made. In order to peacefully resolve this matter, I am following the course of action the attorney has requested in the letter. I will retract my posting, the posting being replaced by the following retraction. Retraction of my March 3rd posting about Serenity Seafood Cafe. Now that I've thought it over, in retrospect, I really should have said to me, the quote unquote line caught rainbow trout tasted like farmed fish because it was almost flavorless and it looked like farmed fish to me because it was the wrong color and crumbly. Perhaps it was indeed wild fish that had just spent too long in the freezer. And I should also have said pertaining to the chicken that, quote, this chicken seemed to me like frozen chicken tenders because it was the size, shape, and texture of large pieces of solid plastic. <laughs> so they got their retraction, but the customer won in the end, right? So how do you thrive, truly thrive, in a world where customers are in charge? I would say it starts with a decision. And rather than telling you what that decision is, let's back into it a little bit. So this is a four-star hotel in a major American city. It's not, it's not in Arizona, don't worry. It's a major American city. So here's the traditional marketing collateral, right? It says they give legendary service and so forth. Well, my eye went right to this OK, you guys are sharp. Right to this accusation. You know, I've done this with bankers. And they're like, what's wrong with that picture, Micah? You know, we chained down our pens. But you got it right away. My eye went right to this accusation that I wanted to steal their stupid $2 corkscrew. So they haven't made the decision. Here's the decision. Are you going to put the customer at the center of your organization, the center of your company, the center of your department, the center of how you design your web forms. So this is another real example. This company has more than 97% of its customers in the United States. Hi, Nita. More than 97% of customers in the United States. And yet, look what I had to do just to get from the S's to the U's. And there weren't any shortcuts. Now, they could. They, you, you guys are, many of you are more technologically savvy than me. And you know they could have uh, figured out who the outliers are through the IP addresses. But instead, they made all of us go through this. My kids and I, we had a lot of fun. You know, oh, where should we go next, next time? Maybe Thailand, Togo, Turkmenistan, and so forth. So they're not putting the customer at the center. Putting the customer, today's customer, at the center is what this presentation is about. And here are five principles. Five principles. Principle number one, devote special attention to the two moments that customers remember the most. Now, I know it's pretty early in the morning. 
Um, I don't see anyone visibly this way, but some of you may be a little hating life right now. Sorry, I have to give you a quiz. Now, don't worry about this, because the worse you do on this quiz, it's a memory test, the better I make my point. But you'll need a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper. This is totally voluntary. If you're not playing along, I'm not going to call you out. Don't worry. Don't worry. So I'm going to read you a list of eight spices. Eight spices, hey. And um, don't feel bad about this. I still have to look at the list. So don't worry if you don't do great at this. But it's eight spices. And are you ready? Everyone have a pen, a pencil, or you're not playing? OK. Number one. I'm only going to read the list once. Number one, tarragon. Number two, chicory. Number three, marjoram. Number four, saffron. Number five, turmeric. Number six, cardamom. Number seven, lavender. Number eight, cinnamon. Are you as ready as you'll ever be to write them down? Amy did smart move and uh, just wrote them down ahead of time. But uh, if you're ready now, please write down the eight spices in order if you can. All right, are you as ready as you'll ever be? How many people got for number one, tarragon? So all about you guys kind of can't see. That's almost everybody. Number two, marjoram. Ha! <laughs> See? So how many people got chicory? So again, it's most people. Number three was marjoram. How many people got that? Still pretty good, but it's dropping off a bit. Number four, saffron. It's dropping off even more, even though so many of us love Indian cooking. Number five, turmeric. So it's, it's really shallowing out now. Cardamom. Twelve people. Awesome. Lavender. OK, it's picking up a little bit. Cinnamon. Most people. So this, um, this is the pattern. I put the spices in a different order so people wouldn't accidentally or on purpose Google this and mess up my results. But this is the pattern. If I did this a 1,000 times, the spices at the beginning are easy to remember. The spices at the end are easy. In the middle, it kind of hollows out. Now, I honestly do not care even a little bit about um, how good you guys are at memorizing spices. What I do care about is the concept that the human memory cannot retain everything. It remembers things based on educated guesses that your brain makes about what's going to be important. And all things being equal, a customer is going to remember what happens at the beginning of a beginning of their time with you and the end. The challenge is that the beginning can start anywhere. This is a, a big box store. This is in a nice leafy suburb where I used to live. And you can see where they think the customer experience starts. The manager has put, I think this is kind of sweet, they put the, um, the carts, the, the shopping carts outside which both says welcome and says this will be more or less a um, self-service experience. However, this, if you, a lot of people walk in my neighborhood, and this is your first experience. And I do think every two or three years, whether she thinks it needs it or not, she should do something about the first thing the customers see. Now, if you drive there, it's no better. Right? And this would be your first and your last impression. And it looks like they have anger issues against people with disabilities. So it's hard to figure out where the customer experience begins. The customer's first impression might be your website or your mobile site. We all spend a lot of time making them really pretty, right? But it's also important that it has the functionality that people want. I was doing something for a jewelry company jewelry company recently. And their website was beautiful, but it didn't have um, prox a proximity effect. So every time I would get the list of all of their stores, instead of the ones that I was in the back of, a, back of, the, of the car, and it, it would never 
intelligently suggest which one was near me. Social reviews, these can be really, really painful. I was talking with, you know, Tom Colicchio, the top chef uh, judge, and he's a great restaurateur. He said what kills him is he's very open to having people complain when they're in his restaurant. He'll do anything for them. What kills him is at 2 a.m. he'll hear on Yelp that the fish was too salty or whatever. This is hard to deal with. He says, I can't help them at 2 in the morning. We're closed. So this is hard to deal with. Now, one little trick is that Google reviews are less scientific than um, Yelp and all, and all the other ones. There's less filtering going on. So it is possible, depending on the size of your business, to um, improve how you're doing in Google reviews. And it, it, uh, Google may be in the house. I'm just going to give you guys a, a, a secret. They're kind of a monopoly. Um, they have enough lobbyists that by law they're not considered a monopoly. But because of their power, Google reviews tend to show up first. So use this to your advantage. Just do as best as you can on the Google reviews, and you're golden. Google Street View, or actually it can be called Business View. Instead of letting the default happen, you know, with a little red man on the, on the sidewalk, you can actually game this. You can pay some good photographers to control what the Street View looks like. And I think this is really smart. So this is a camera store. This is a Panasonic dealer. And the first thing you'll notice about the street view is their chairs are perfectly placed and so forth. Do you see that, the director's chairs? That's because they knew this shoot was coming. But it's better than that. The next picture, this actually all happens continuously, but the next picture is an open door right into their showroom. And the next one is their showroom. So you can be inviting customers in even before they get anywhere near your business. Number two. The Jetsons test. The reason you people are here, the Jetsons test is a cute little system you can use to figure out, or at least to think about, what should be done on a self-service basis and what requires human intervention. So the Jetsons test was, the Jetsons was a show in 1963. Um, it was only on for a season or two. It takes place in 2063. And even though they got a lot of things wrong about the future, for example, people still smoke in the future, um, they got a lot of things wrong. The things related to technology and customer service are dead on. They hired a bunch of futurists, and they did an amazing job. So let's look at this. Much of the customer experience is provided by machine. Secretaries don't take dictation. Instead, and listen to how close they got this. They almost nailed this. They got everything right except the internet, right? Secretaries don't take dictation. Instead, callers leave their message on a rewritable vinyl LP. There's self-service push-button bre uh, breakfasts. Chores around the house are taken care of by Rosie the robot, who's pictured there. Um, do any of you have uh, an iRobot that mops your floor? OK, so, uh, so iRobot. Is this, it doesn't do that good a, a job of cleaning the floor, but it does a lot better job than I would, because I would never get around to it. So, so iRobot's really cute, and the way it navigates is it would go right up, to, right up to your table there. It would bump into it, and then it makes a mental note never to go in that far again. It works pretty well. Now, we have a completely blind little beagle. Completely, 100%. He navigates by exactly the same method. He, he walks along, he would bump into this speaker here, he, and he'd never go that way again. It works for him as well. The problem is neither of them really know about the existence of, of each other. Human-delivered service adds warmth and friendly engagement. So there's the friendly, southern-accented receptionist. Henry, who's pictured here, he's the super, the superintendent for their skyscraper that looks like um, the Space Needle. Um, but mostly he's a, a friend of the family. Uh, if their dog, Astro, gets lost, he, he'll find it for them. There's occasional cab drivers and such who provide human interactions and laughs. So this is a useful way to divide the customer experience. If the service can be delivered via automation or self-service, at least offer that as an option. 
If the service in question requires or benefits from human warmth, then have your absolute best well-trained, well-hired human beings take care of it. And the exceptions, which are in some ways are the most interesting uh, moments, are when, um, when it's a judgment call, when warmth would be at the expense of efficiency or vice versa. So here's an example where no humans are, are required. This is called My Lowe's for the hardware store. So you can retrieve your warranty information. You can get tips for other things to buy, accessories and so forth, based on your shopping history. This one, maybe humans are required. So this is um, functionality from a company called IQ Metrics. And it's the same woman, but in one place I'm having her pose as the salesperson, which is what she actually is. In the other case, she's being the customer. This, if you're feeling antisocial and you're the customer, um, you can use this yourself. But if you want the assistance of someone in the store, you can do it together. This is the judgment call area right here. So many business class live flat um, configurations on airlines are completely automated. When, it's bed, when you decide it's bedtime, you, you press the button and it's all ready. And they have, it's all, that's it. So this can be done. However, Air New Zealand has decided to go in the other direction. They've set it up so you have to tell a flight attendant that you're ready to go to bed. And then he or she will make up your bed. So this was a choice. They, didn't, they wanted to keep the human act interaction in it. This is a choice. It's not good, it's not bad. It's a choice that you can make as a, a company. Number three, customers want an eye level, peer on peer, authentic style of customer service. Now I put authentic in quote because if you authentically want to tell them to go fuck themselves, you probably shouldn't. But authentic style of customer service. So here's a quote from someone uh, that I interviewed. I did a book for Forbes on providing customer service to millennials. So this was a younger uh, traveler, and this is what she said. The kind of customer service I enjoy is mutually respectful when a service or sales employee seems on a par with me, and we enjoy each other as a result. By on a par, I mean that we are social equivalents, even though they are serving me and I am paying to be served. And this is not a new idea. In fact, the legendary Ritz Carlton is based on the idea that we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. You should, you should expect respect as a customer service agent, and you should give respect to your customers. But a lot of companies have forgotten this because they've gotten so scripted, they've made their employees be so servile. Eye-to-eye -eye customer service is what most customers want. Scripted service provided by servile, unempowered employees who have to run and get a manager if they're going to do anything for a customer is really out of date, even at a highly, highly automated company like Amazon. So these are actual screenshots. I'm sorry if they're a little hard to read. So first, the backstory. The person at Amazon who did this chat is a brand new employee. In, they have a call center in Cape Town, South Africa. Brand new employee, clearly a highly educated employee though, however. Um, so his actual honest to God name is Thor. Thor, you are now connected to Amazon. Uh, the customer says, eh, the tracking shows that my book was delivered, but the shipment was actually not received. Warmest greetings, and then the customer name is blocked out there. My name is Thor. Greetings, Thor. Can I be Odin? So we've got an epic customer as well here. So instead of Thor saying, oh, I've never heard that before, he says, Odin, father. Odin, in, in Norse mythology, Odin is Thor's father, right? OK, so Odin, father, how are they doing on this here fine day? Thor, my son. Agony raises upon life. <laughs> Amazon, Thor. This is outrageous. Who dares defy the All-Father Odin? What has occurred to cause this agony? Customer, Odin. I am afraid the book I ordered to defeat our enemies has been misplaced. 
how can we keep Valhalla intact without our sacred book? Amazon. This is blasphemy. Wherever this book has been taken to, I shall make it my duty to get it back to you. I fear it is Loki. Loki is the kind of mischievous, uh, he's the Iago of Norse mythology. I fear it is Loki. Well, that reference fell on uh, crickets. I fear it is Loki, but I dare not blame him for such things. I shall have your fortune return to you, and thereafter we can begin to create a new quest in order to get the book back to you. So what this means in English is he has to refund he has to refund the customer for the book. Then the customer can order it again. So Odin says, very well, my son. Allow me some time to round up my allies and complete this, please, father. Do it for me, Thor, but most importantly, do it for the mortals whose destiny and grades rely on this book. <laughs> Amazon, the treasure has been returned to you. You now need to reinstate the book into your archive so that you may yet receive it soon. I shall, ha shall have the Valkyrie deliver it to you as fast as their wings can move. So maybe not every, it's important to know, it's important to realize that the customer service at a agent at Amazon took the cue from the customer, right? Some of us cannot be bothered with this stuff. Some of us are in a big hurry. And when you get the scripted authenticity, it's terrible. When you go into a place and they're like, how's your day going? And you're like, oh, you really didn't want to ask me that question. Uh, it, it can be hard. So a lot of it is picking up on the customer, which I think the agent did in that case. Number four, help customers collect and share social currency. So I think a lot of us are in business are very uh, committed to having a relationship with our customers. And that's very important. However, we tend to forget that customers have relationships with other customers, and we are almost tangential in a lot of cases. So the best thing we can do is to be a conduit for those relationships. One way we can be a conduit is to help them share what I would call social currency. So there's no more before, during, and after in dining, shopping, and travel. It's all during. So I see a lot of you have maybe only heard about this on the History Channel, but in the olden days, you would dream about taking a trip, you would save your money, you would take your trip, and only when you got home, only when you got home, would you tell your friends about it. Now, while you were on the trip, unbeknownst to your friends, you took a couple rolls of photos, which you then had to develop into slides. I don't even want to explain what slides are, but slides go into this thing, which is called a carousel. And you invite your neighbors over to not enjoy looking at the slides of your trip. And inevitably, a couple of them are in backwards, and it really upsets you, but your friends think it's funny because the t-shirts read backwards and so forth. So that's how it used to be. It's not like that anymore. It's all deering, right? You're thinking about where to go, you ask your friends, right? You're, um, you're there, you're already taking pictures. You know, you're, you're getting on the Disney boat and you're already taking pictures of waiting in the line to get on the Disney boat. This is how it happened. Uh, and so forth. Even now, you know, you want to take this trip, you don't have any money, you can, uh, you can do GoFundMe, right? And I hope people don't say, that. Ah, go fund yourself, buddy. But, um, <laughs> So it's hard to realize how quickly we've changed here. Here's a quote from Hervé Omler, who is the wonderful president and CEO of, I'm sorry, COO of the Ritz-Carlton. Only eight or 10 years ago, it was common for guests, when he says guests, he means loaded guests, to be traveling around the globe, aiming to accumulate possessions, furs in Asia, porcelain in Europe, you could reverse those two, actually. Uh, carpets in the Middle East or in India. But today, they travel for the experience, for the engagement. Or, to put it a lot more simply, if it's not on my phone, it didn't happen. Now, it's not just millennials anymore. You know, there's actually a Facebook called um, My Life's Officially Over, My Parents Joined Facebook. So, 
True fact. So it's, it's everybody. So businesses that can encourage this and make it part of their business are really doing well. Warby Parker, um, oh my God, I'm gonna tell you guys a story about Warby Parker. Don't tell anyone, okay? So, so I write for Forbes.com and I have very high ethical standards. I would never change an article because a corporation asked me to. However, I did make one exception because the request was so ridiculous. I wrote this really nice article about Warby Parker. They called and they said, mm, there's this problem with your story, Mr. Solomon. I was like, okay, what? Would it be okay if you didn't use the word hipster? <laughs> so, you know, there are worse things to do than to humor a re request like that. So I took it out. I, I put in like, you know, moron or something. No, I, I don't. I, I don't remember what I substituted for hipster, but, but I did. But anyway, Warby Parker is doing great because they build their business on sharing. It's one of the many things that they build their business on, but sharing. So it's not only that you're buying sunglasses or regular glasses, it's that your friends can vote on which glasses you're buying. It's very, very smart. Drybar, I'm trying to see if any of you have the hair for Drybar. Do you ever go to Drybar? No, you have like sensible hair. Um, so dry bar is a place, it's only for women or maybe guys who are in hair bands. That's it. Um, but all they do is they blow out your hair it's, it, and, and they give you a great experience. That's what makes dry bar so wonderful. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. They have movies, they have, um, it's just set up really, really well. And one other thing they do is that after you have your blowout, after you have your hair done, you, you can post it on their Facebook page and your friends can vote on it. And if your blowout is the best before and after, you become a VIP. Nordstrom. So Nordstrom is a company that goes back well over 100 years. They go back to the Alaska, to the Klondike Gold Rush, which was in the 1800s, 1868, something like that. So they'd be the last people you'd think would innovate. However, um, they have an app. It has a dressing room section of the app and you can put things in the dressing room to make a look, and then you can take it to your friends and get their opinion. Here's another retailing scenario. Millennials aren't always comfortable talking with sales staff, but they do a lot of screen sharing. So look at, you know, picture these as the, the personal shopper and the person in the store, and the one says, this is cute, isn't it? Hands the customer the tablet. The tab the, Customer looks at the tablet and says, yeah, add it to my closet or add it to my cart. And that works pretty well. Classic question you've never, I hope, never been asked before. <laughs> Do your buns look good on Instagram? I am not talking about Kim K breaking the internet. I'm talking, I know, let down here. I'm talking about Chili's. So Chili's decided that their hamburger buns just weren't photographing well. This is absolutely true. Weren't photographing well. They spent about $100,000 to put, you can see it, that glaze on their buns. It doesn't taste any different. It just looks different. And this, which was kind of the old timey, I think this is not a bad look for your wings and such while you're eating them. However, it photographs like hell, right? I mean, that doesn't look tidy. So this is what they changed it to, this uh, very more controlled stainless steel container and it's all about wanting their customers to share more and to have the sharing go well. Now there is another side to this which is um, going back to the Ritz Carlton which is very careful about their brand. In spite of being very careful about their brand they only use user generated contact on their content on their Instagram. No professional photos and they trust their customers enough to, that they're providing it and if they like it they regram it. So I'm not saying that you have to go the Chili's way and, and try to control everything. This hotel is colloquially known, that's a hard word, colloquially known as the Instagram hotel. It's in Sydney, Australia, and um, they map out where interesting Instagram sites would be. They also make their rooms all very photogenic, so you can be like, well, see me in room, whatever it is, 401, right? My next trip, I'm going to be in 403. They even have this frame in the lobby, right? So this is by connecting your customers, making sure you end up in the picture. By the way, another tip, 
if the sponsor of a wonderful, wonderful conference you're at has any interesting elements in their logo, be sure you animate them and get them on your slides. Customers today, especially millennials, are the enemy of stupid. Anyone have millennial employees? Is anyone a millennial employee? I know that's true. Um, so millennials will come up to you if you're a boss. Boss, you got a second? No, not really. And I'm going to tell you anyway. And they'll tell you that they don't understand why you're still using this old Excel spreadsheet, right? They are the enemy of stupid. Well, they're the enemy of stupid as customers as well. Don't make your customers search for what I call stupid shit. Okay? Nobody wants to call you to ask what your GPS address is because you only have your P.O. box on your website, right? Nobody wants to call you for that. Consider crowdsourcing as an adjunct to your customer support. Because what's the, if you wanted to know something about Apple, something wasn't going right. Like right now my phone's bricked, and if anyone knows what to do about it, I would love to know that. The first thing you do is you ask the cloud, right? You go onto Google and you say, my phone's bricked, what should I do? Hopefully you have another device to do this on. So customers are doing this anyway. So a company like Adobe, which um, does photo, Photoshop and other programs for um, professional users, they realize they have a lot of people who know more about their product than they do, and in very specific situations. So if someone has perfected how to take out a freckle from Micah's arm and writes the perfect answer to how to remove freckles from your forearm, Adobe is not going to replicate their, their effort. What they're going to do, they're going to certify it. They're going to certify that this is the approved answer. And so what does the professional who spent their time doing this get? They get to be an Adobe creative professional. It pays zero, but you get a lot of bragging points. You can put this on uh, your business card. So consider crowdsourcing as an adjunct. Streamline everything that doesn't contribute to the customer experience. This is really easy to do. And in fact, if you go back to Warby Parker, what do their stores look exactly like? They look like Apple stores. Say Apple stores. <laughs> they look just like the Apple stores, except they have, um, wow, sorry, <laughs> except they have uh, eyeglasses in them. Well, what is that look? That look is the look of streamlining. Apple was the first where there wasn't a cash register, there weren't these paper receipts, there wasn't any of that stuff to get in the way of the experience. And it is kind of wonderful to so streamline everything that doesn't contribute to the customer experience. For customers today, every click they have to make, every extra click is one click too many. Now here's the good news. We used to talk about lifetime customer value. Have you heard that lifetime customer value? So you would do a study, you would figure out, and these lifetime customer values it can be very, very high. But I think we're all nervous using that as a metric now because uh, sorry, customers, it's easier for them to switch now, right? So we're nervous about using that metric. I think that's still a good metric. I think customers can be very loyal. However, here's a metric which I guarantee is improving the lifetime network value of every customer, because it's so much easier to share, so much easier to share. And it is today's ethos, today's zeitgeist, or as we say today, it's a thing, right? Sharing is a thing. This is the most understated statistic I could give you. The vast majority of millennials report taking action on behalf of brands. I think it's all of them, and it's their parents as well. It's just what all of us do today. Now, it's not only online, and I'm going to close with an offline story. That's actually my son in the picture trying to look like an angry uh, customer. Uh, so my son used to go to a school. It wasn't a, really a religious school. It's a Quaker school. Uh, any of you know what that is, Quaker school? All right. So all right. Well, first, if you don't know, the second season of Homeland the daughter, the daughter of the terrorist is um, at a private school in Washington, D.C., which is supposed to be Sidwell Friends School. And she uses a bad word 
Uh, she calls the other kid a douche, <laughs> and then and the, the, the headmaster comes along and says, oh, you know, that's not what we do. That's not what we do in silent meetings. So what is this silent meeting? The silent meeting is when, I know you can say douche because it's one of the only bad words you can use on TV. It, it slipped past the FCC, so I know that. Um, so she said this bad word. The story on silent meeting is that the kids at the school once a week are supposed to sit there and be absolutely quiet until they're spiritually moved to speak. Now my son went to a Quaker school and it's amazing that these kids can be quiet because they're really little. My son was six at the time the story takes place. And we lived right next to the, st the school and the head of admissions texted my wife, they're good friends, texted my wife and said, your son finally shared in silent meeting today. We're like, oh my God, because we are profoundly unspiritual people. So, so they're like, oh my God. And so they're like, what, 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 did, what, what, did, um, what did he say? And she said, well, you should ask him when he gets home. So he gets home and we're like, honey, what moved you to speak? What did you share? He said, I said, the latest iPad will be available for purchase online Thursday night at midnight. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you coming. Thank you, Next Eva, for the wonderful conference. <laughs>